Hello, my friends, and welcome to The Bible in Order, where we are chronologically going through the entire Bible in one year. Today's reading for October 26th is Luke chapters 12 and 13. People are gathering together by the thousands to hear Jesus teach and preach and watch him perform miraculous signs because they were desperate for something different. They recognized the hypocrisy of the religious leaders, and that's why Jesus says in this passage to his disciples, Beware the leaven of the Pharisees. They say one thing in public, but they do something else behind closed doors. They teach or preach a good message, but it doesn't come from within them. It just sounds good. There's no power in it. And so the people have been left spiritually hungry, like sheep without a shepherd, not knowing which way to go. Sounds a lot like our society today, where so many people heard the gospel their entire life, and yet they don't know the power of God. This is why Jesus says, Beware the leaven or the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And nothing that is done in the dark will not have a light shown on it. What you've whispered in an ear in private rooms will be proclaimed on the rooftops. Don't let this hypocrisy even come into you. Just like when you make bread and you have this big batch of dough, if you get a little yeast in that dough, the entire batch becomes affected by it. Don't even have a little hypocrisy. Be careful who you fear. Don't fear people. Don't fear the one who can take your life. Fear the one who judges your soul and determines where you're spending eternity. Doesn't God take care of the sparrows? How much more will he take care of you? He'll take care of you. What are you afraid of? Jesus said, anyone who acknowledges me before other people, he will acknowledge before the angels of God. But whoever denies him will be denied by him. Someone in the crowd asks Jesus, Hey, can you tell my brother to share the inheritance with me? Jesus responses, How is that any of my business? Who made me a judge between you and your brother? And then he tells the parable of a man who is building up wealth and has nowhere to store it. And so he builds a bigger barn to hold all of the harvest. And then God speaks to him and says, You fool. Your very life will be demanded of you tonight. Don't store up for yourself riches that will perish, but be rich toward God and he will pour out for you an abundant harvest in the eternal where it does not perish, where it does not rust, where there is no moth destroying it. And it's not at all saying that he is against physical wealth in this world, but he's saying prioritize. Put the priority, if you ever have to choose between a dollar and a prayer, choose the prayer. If you ever have to choose between doing something for yourself or doing something for the kingdom of heaven, do it for the kingdom of heaven. Don't forsake the kingdom to build your business. Seek the kingdom first, and then God will add it to your business. Where Jesus says, don't worry, it literally can be translated, don't care, don't be distracted, don't be anxious, don't be troubled. Look at the ravens. Now, he was just talking about the sparrows a few paragraphs before, and now he mentions the raven. The raven doesn't have a pantry. It doesn't have a warehouse. It doesn't farm. It doesn't plant seed, and it doesn't harvest it. It doesn't store it anywhere. But God cares for the raven. He gives it food, clothes it. It has everything that it needs, and it neither thinks about the past nor the future. It just does what it's supposed to do. If God provides for the raven, the blackbird, how much more will he provide for you? Why is your faith so small? Of course, the obvious answer is we don't have Satan going after attacking the raven. The raven's oblivious. It doesn't have that purpose. But we are given the choice to overcome. We are overcomers. We are more than conquerors. 
because we go through this battle. And at the end of our days, we will lift our heads and hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, because we chose not to worry. And we chose to be generous towards the kingdom of God, knowing that he was going to meet our every need. Now, if Jesus tells us to do something and we don't do it, is that sin? If Jesus tells us not to do something and we do it anyway, is that sin? Does that mean that worrying is actually sin? There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ, who walk according to the Spirit, but you can't walk according to the Spirit and worry and dwell on your troubles at the same time. And so we have to make a conscious decision to say, Father, I cast my cares upon you. Thank you for caring for me. Father, thank you for making me for your kingdom in the same ways that the lilies of the field are beautiful and gorgeous and well adorned and unmatched. And you've clothed them. How much more will you clothe me? Teach us how to seek your kingdom first. Father, help us to be a people who are ready and waiting for your return, like the servants waiting for their master to come back from the wedding banquet. Let us always act as if you could come at any moment, because you could if you chose. Jesus said, be ready, because the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you don't expect it. And it had to have been a little surprising to the disciples to hear him. They must have thought they were good. They'd been walking with him for three years. And he says these words, and Peter responds in verse 41, Lord, are you talking about us or everyone? Like in general, are you saying people should be ready? Or are you, are you talking to us in particular? The Lord said, who then is the faithful and sensible manager? His master will put in charge of his household servants to give them their allotted food at the proper time. Blessed is that one whom the master finds doing his job when he comes. Tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of even more things. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much will be expected. Verse 49 and 50, Jesus said, I came to bring a fire on the earth. I have a baptism to undergo and how it consumes me until it is finished. That word distressed or consumed is a complex word. It, it could be translated to hold together, to hold fast, to be seized by as if you were seized by an illness. Throughout scripture, it's translated in different ways be pressed together, pressed close, to be pressed in on every side, like confined, to hold fast, to urge, to impel, to pass. I'm afflicted with, like with a sickness. Jesus is afflicted by this baptism. The word baptism is used in extra biblical writings to refer to a cloth that is dipped in a dye goes in one color and comes out another. So it's this close association that changes you. In Corinthians, we're told that the Israelites were baptized into Moses through the Red Sea, that that experience of walking through the sea on dry ground with the walls of water on either side of them changed them. It marked them. This consuming fire that Jesus is being baptized with changed him. But it's not that he was being changed from sinner into saint like we are. He had no sin. He was being compressed, confined, feeling pressed in on every side, being held fast like a prisoner, given the choice moment by moment, will you endure this? And if we just hold on to the end, we will be saved. Friends, if you can look at the sky and tell if it's going to rain, if you can feel the wind blow and know if it's going to be a hot afternoon, how much more should you be able to pay attention to the spiritual signs to know that the return of our master is coming soon. Be ready. Endure this fire baptism that we're going through right now. 
hold on. Know that at the end of the day, your perseverance will pay off. Chapter 13, people are coming to him going, do you hear about that horrible accident where those people died over there? Jesus cuts straight to the unasked question. Do you think you're better than they are? Because that happened to them and it didn't happen to you yet. Unless you repent, it'll happen to you the same way it happened to them. We should take this to heart in these days as we are watching people being slain in other countries. In scripture, the fig tree is a picture of Israel much of the time. And Jesus tells the story of a man who has a fig tree in his garden that doesn't produce any fruit. It's been three years, no fruit. Chop that tree down. The gardener says, let's give it one more year, sir, if we may. I'll dig a trench around it. I will give it some fertilizer next year. If there's no fruit, then by all means, chop it down. It's talking about believers. It's talking about the children of God, the Israelites, the chosen ones of God. Are you bearing fruit? Get one last chance to bear some fruit before it's chopped down. This is what John was talking about. Blade of the axe is already laid at the root. This tree is about to be chopped down. That tree is us, by the way. This is our last chance, guys. When Jesus sees a woman who's been bent over in pain for 18 years because she's been afflicted by a demon, he heals her. He says, woman, you are free of your disability. The religious zealots say, how dare you do that? Don't you know it's a Sabbath? You can heal people six days a week. Don't do it today. Jesus responds again, you hypocrites. Which of you, if you have a donkey, you don't go and tie it up or let it go? How much more should this woman who's been tied up, she's been bound for 18 years, how much more should she not be set free? He humiliated his adversaries, but the whole crowd was rejoicing over all the things he did. Jesus' teaching was so revolutionary that in verse 23, somebody came to him and said, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? And it has the connotation that I thought this was good news for the world, and yet it seems so exclusive when you teach it, when I listen to the words that are coming out of your mouth. Jesus' response is, make every effort to come through the narrow door. Don't do what the world is doing. Don't think that because everyone else you see is going that way, that that's the right way to go. Those people who are all going their own way, who are following each other, they're not going to enter into my kingdom. When I return, they're going to say, hey, let me in. I was one of your people. Let us in. Remember, you, we ate and drank with you. You taught in our streets. We welcomed you. Remember us. And he's going to say to them on that day, I never knew you. You guys do evil. Just get away from me. In verse 34, Jesus laments over Jerusalem after he has said that he's got to go there because that's where prophets die. He knows the end has come. He knows that they will not repent and they will not accept him. They will not allow God to do the work God wants to do. And you can hear the voice of Jesus strain. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophet and stones those who are sent to her. I've often wanted to gather your children together, but you were not willing. Your house is abandoned to you. I don't know about you, but I would not want to live in a house that God himself abandoned, that God left it and said, there you go. It's yours now. You take it. Wherever he goes, I want to go. Whatever he says, I want to do, as hard as it is, as consuming as the fire of this baptism is, there is no other life for those who want him, who truly want him. God bless you, my friends. I know that you want him because you're persevering through this. Thank you for being on this journey with me through the word of God. We'll see you tomorrow. And for those of you who are interested in supporting the Bible in order, I am a real estate agent with Call It Closed International Realty. I sell houses in Southwest Florida. I would love to earn your business. 
And I'm also mentoring real estate agents around the country. We have agents in 16 states so far, and we're looking for agents to help us open up operations in more as well as other countries. We would love the opportunity to partner with you in furthering your business. And I'm also grateful for your support as we do what we can to further the kingdom of heaven. Thank you for your consideration.